an especial thanks to anybody who's bought the book. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands at this point. Um, but congratulations to those of you who just uh, waved it. Um, hopefully anybody who, who hasn't had a chance uh, to acquire the book might, might feel motivated um, by the end of the uh, evening to do so. I mean, normally in, in the good old days of BC, you know, before coronavirus, I would have come along with a box of the things um, to sell at a discounted price um, at the end of the at the end of the talk at the end of the session. Unfortunately, we can't do things that way at the moment. But uh, I believe that on the sign-in page that Oxfordshire Green Party provided, there is a link to somewhere where you can um, acquire the book should you want to. Um, however, enough of this sordid commercialism. Um, let me get on to. Um, saying a bit about where this book came from and a bit more about what's in it. So, um, as well as working at Lancaster University, I'm co-chair of this small think tank called Greenhouse, which was founded uh, in 2011 by Rupert Reid of the Green Party and, and others. Um, it aims to lead the development of green thinking in the UK. It's, it's formally independent of political parties, although there is a degree of overlap in personnel, a considerable degree of overlap in personnel with the Green Party. Um, I'm a member myself. Um, it's avowed role is to challenge ideas that have created the world we live in now and to offer positive alternatives. And as you might think, um, that's quite a, a challenge and quite an uncomfortable business in the uh, world in which we find ourselves, the, the positivity especially. And so it has been with the work which produced this, this book, Facing Up to Climate, Reality, Honesty, Disaster and Hope. It goes back, its genesis goes back to a session at one of Greenhouse's annual summer meetings of everybody. Um, we normally work you know, by phone and email, but we meet up um, face to face at least a couple of times a year. And people sat around in one session and actually addressed the question, how long do we think we've got? And um, it was quite surprising how, um, how gloomy people seemed to be and also how liberated they felt by having the opportunity to to bring their gloom out into the open and, and express the concerns and um, fears that they had um, about what seemed to be the quite rapidly narrowing window of opportunity to avoid climate and ecological catastrophe. Um, and the energy of attention that that generated led to our, our mounting a public event in Lancaster back in January 2016 on the theme of facing up to climate change and out of that and various other pieces of work that followed it came this this collection um, facing up to climate reality uh, essays by a number of greenhouse core group members and associates which was published in April of last year the whole premise of the book is that Honesty, honesty about our present situation, uh, is something which not only conventional politics, but actually green politics as well, has found hard, um, but which is now absolutely necessary as a prerequisite for any sort of effective action. So what do we claim that honestly facing up to climate reality does actually mean? Well, in the first place, as the introductory chapter of the book spells out, it means accepting that the Paris Agreement has been no game changer. Achievement of the Paris goals depends entirely on self-monitored meeting by signatory countries of their self-set emissions reduction targets, a process which resembles nothing so much as a bunch of alcoholics policing their own safe drinking levels. Um, and even if such a process inspired any confidence, the whole regime based on the two degree C Paris target um, 
as science now makes irresistibly clear, would be far too little, far too late. It takes no account of feedback effects, release of methane from thawing permafrost, etc. Um, nor of the essentially untested nature of the climate models, which um, events are already showing to have underestimated significantly the extent and the rate of adverse change. So the clear implication of all that is that global temperature rise will be at the very least three to four degrees C over pre-industrial levels by the end of this century. And that will bring in its train floods, droughts, famines, mass migrations, and probably wars, disasters which are now inevitable. Now, of course, the strong temptation at this point is to say almost inevitable. Um, but the almost is really a fudge. These disasters are now inevitable and they will lead on to climate and ecological catastrophe unless, and here is what wiggle room there is, unless the world now transforms its societies and economies on a scale and at a speed for which there is absolutely no precedent in human affairs. And let me just emphasize that last point with an illustration. It actually comes from my own chapter in the book. So I don't know if you've discovered the Guardian website's carbon count, the Guardian's carbon countdown website um, is linked to the Guardian, I think. It's invaluable. It's a real time um, tally of the carbon being added to the atmosphere worldwide. You click in and you see. Um, the figure, as it were, racing up as you watch. Um, last time I checked, that was going at the rate of 80,000 tonnes of carbon equivalent per minute being added to the atmosphere worldwide. That is um, more than 1,300 tonnes per second, which is the weight of about 105 Routemaster buses, you know, Boris buses. Um, so that's some 31,000 buses worth of the stuff that's gone up there around the world in the last five minutes, you know, since I started talking roughly. Um, and then when you think that atmospheric carbon is a gas, and imagine how far you personally would have to drive in order to emit even one tonne of it, um, you begin to register the gigantic scale and the frenzied intensity at which global human activity is, is currently spewing out this climate destabilizing pollutant. And of course, these eye glazing magnitudes also measure the scale and speed of the shifts which would be required in order to render even some moderated version of this worldwide activity carbon neutral, even by mid-century, which the science now tells us would be too late. And change on such a massive scale and at such a breakneck speed is without the faintest shadow of a historical precedent. So to have any prospect at all of achieving such change, we're talking about a forced march through painfully rapid downshifting, downsizing, and reconfiguring expectations in every corner of our lives. And not just our lives, that's the lives of those of us who broadly know the score. Um, but of all the millions who are still kept in ignorance by a prostituted media. Um, and then the book's chapters, uh, written by Greenhouse um, core group members and associates, are mainly a series of studies of what such a revolutionary transformation would have to involve in various key fields. So um, Richard McNeil Douglas, uh, shows that the systemic drive towards accumulation, hitherto characteristic of the dominant form of capitalism, is simply incompatible with an economy respecting environmental limits. I mean, you might not be surprised by that result, but Neil Douglas demonstrates it with um, extreme acuity. Uh, Rupert Reed and Kristen Steele emphasize how hopes for retrieving human flourishing out of climate disaster turn on what ordinary people might be able to bring out of extraordinary situations, which in turn requires a, a concerted shift of our political and economic arrangements towards rebuilding local community. 
Jonathan Essex demonstrates how if we're going to stop the juggernaut of carbon intensive urbanization, that means um, a new and much more rigorous form of land use planning, emissions reduction and resilience development as a coordinated effort. Um, and Chapman's case study of a dangerous UK weather event, the, the Lancaster floods, which were caused by Storm Desmond in 2015, flags up how we need completely to defragilize our enabling arrangements uh, for everyday life. So that, as it were, you know, when you get a flood, um, you don't have to find that uh, you can't get into somebody's garage or somebody's flat because there's an electric door, the electricity which isn't working because the electricity is generated by the generator down by the riverbank where the flood is, all that kind of stuff. To meet the oncoming normalization of the extreme. I mean, you know, those, those are just a few of the chapters. There's lots more along these lines in the book. I haven't time to as it were, go through it chapter by chapter, but um, we can talk about any that, that people have um, found interesting other than the ones I've mentioned uh, when we get to the discussion, if people would like. But to repeat, human societies have never before in history been confronted with a demand for change on anything like this scale at anything like this speed. What might that mean for hoping to achieve such change and for activities like those of the Green Party and campaigns like those of Extinction Rebellion, which actually depend on hope? It's not accidental that the book's subtitle is Honesty, Disaster and Hope. Because I, we all think this is really the crunch issue for climate honesty. They're really hard part of facing up to what we all here, I guess, you know, really know, but tend to recoil from admitting, maybe even to ourselves, because admitting it now seems so inimical to any well-founded hope. Human beings need hope to keep going, particularly to keep persisting in any difficult and daunting enterprise. You as Green Party activists will all know that intimately. You know, sometimes you, you need hope just to get out of bed and get on to the next task. But hope is more than just, you know, wanting something nice to come about. To hope for X is to want X while recognizing that you might not get it, but believing that you are at least in with a chance of getting it. That is to say, genuine hope must address itself to a real chance however slender of the hope for things happening. And aspirations which, which fail to meet this condition of realism, as we might call it, can't actually do the hard work of hope, the, the work of actually getting you out of bed morning after morning to continue fighting against the odds. But if hope for avoiding climate catastrophe has to meet a condition of realism, what on all the honestly confronted hard evidence of the unprecedented nature of our plight, can we realistically hope for? Something like the Hobbesian world imagined in John Lanchester's recent novel, The War. I don't know if anybody's come across that. It's well worth reading if you haven't. Its narrative premise is a, a 15 foot high concrete barrier built continuously around the shores of the British mainland with the aim of excluding both rising seas and waves of attempted migration from elsewhere in a flooded world. Is that what we can hope for realistically? When you remember that your kids and grandkids, and maybe even some of you, will have to live in such a world, that hardly feels like hope at all. And yet, what more does all the weight of past human experience point to as possible? Doesn't history insist that if we get even that much, we'll be lucky? Now, the pivotal point of my own chapter in this book is that actually past experience doesn't have the last word on the realism of your hopes. 
that's at bottom a philosophical point, but then um, as um, Kate mentioned, I am at bottom a philosopher. Um, what we predict as empirically likely or unlikely must be held to be so on the basis of we're projecting forward, extrapolating forward the general forms and patterns within which past events have been experienced. But of course, transformative change consists by definition in a move ju beyond just those forms. As Rebecca Solnit says in her powerful and inspiring book, Hope in the Dark, Hope of the kind that we now need is, quote, not about what we expect, but an embrace of the essential unknowability of the world. The thought being that human creativity, human radical agency, capacity to initiate the genuinely new are as real and therefore as realistic as the world of empirical odds stacked over against us. And we must trust ourselves in the climate case, therefore, to what I call life hope, others have called it radical hope, invested in possibilities of change which no odds can rule out, because by definition, transformation always happens against the odds. And this is maybe the place to touch on the, the current pandemic, you know, the cause of our meeting in this odd semi-detached way this evening. Um, for after all, who would have given any odds at all just a few weeks ago that economies and lifestyles could be transformed in the way they have been across the world in response to this threat? And some people are already arguing that this experience ought to boost our hopefulness about the realism of transformation in the face of other existential threats. So as it were, you know, recognising that driving less and shopping locally and working from home and developing and intensifying community solidarity have worked in helping to stem the virus or will have worked eventually in helping to stem the virus. It's being suggested indicates that people may be readier to bring these and similar lifestyle changes to bear in the service of addressing the climate emergency. Uh, now, that's an interesting thought. Um, I'm unconvinced myself. It seems to me pretty speculative. Uh, we may well find when lockdown ceases just how powerfully people have missed driving and escaping to the office to get away from the family um, and so on. But that apart, the real difficulty in my view is that this line of thought obscures the radical difference between the COVID and the climate emergencies. And that is that COVID kills indiscriminately and in the full glare of media publicity, um, so that everyone is likely to be scared to a greater or lesser extent um, by the immediate possibility that they or their loved ones um, will get it, suffer from it, die of it. And of course, in many cases too, people are if you like, more altruistically scared about uh, the collapse of key public services on which everyone relies if the pandemic um, gets out of control. The, the upshot of this general fear and concern has been widespread acceptance, at least temporarily, it seems, according to, you know, which media outlet you read, it seems as if it might be unravelling a bit at the moment. Um, widespread acceptance of lockdown and the related public health measures. But the climate emergency and its implications only scare a minority of people. Those who couple honesty and courage with the intelligence to understand the science and heed it, and the imagination to bring the predicted impacts of global overheating vividly before their minds, and the reflectiveness to realize that, you know, once you've seen that, you can't just shrug it off and get on with your life because it kind of robs life of meaning. And regrettably, but I think undeniably, this is actually quite a small minority at the moment. I mean, we tend to be embarrassed about saying that because, of course, we here all belong to it. We wouldn't be on the call if we didn't. <laughs> but it is one of those inadmissible things, I think, that everybody knows. Um, it is a small minority, and in the immediate future, at any rate, there's 
there will only be climate driven disasters testifying to the existence of a frightening climate emergency for that minority. Majority readiness to confront them as such is not perhaps to be expected until much further down the road and many more climate driven disasters later. Now, of course, this is not an issue which figures in the book under discussion because, you know, COVID wasn't even a gleam in anybody's eye at the time when we put this book together. But it might nevertheless be something that people would like to think about and explore in the discussion because it does, I think, reflect something which certainly is in the book and indeed <clears throat> runs through it all, which is the recognition that facing up to climate reality now means accepting that we are in a tragic situation. That is a kind of situation where hope invested in transformative change can only keep itself realistic by consciously refusing to be utopian, refusing the craving for win-wins where we can somehow act to preserve all our values at once. Maybe the upshot of genuinely facing up to the reality of our situation is acknowledging the need now to sacrifice some key values to others. Perhaps full participatory democracy to the value of action by this already conscious minority to seize power and avert catastrophe. For if this minority doesn't take power within the next two decades, if green ideas, if the green program doesn't take power within the next two decades, and how is it going to do that if we look at, you know, the last election result, 3% of the electorate supporting the Green Party? If it doesn't do that, well, we're all screwed. As it were, recognising that sort of cleft stick and uh, the difficulties around it is really what we mean by facing up to climate reality in honesty, facing up to potential disaster in honesty, are still trying to preserve hope. But that's the order of question, if that is the order of question raised by the book's attempt to be honest about the prospects of disaster and about the conditions of hope, um, and if it provokes discussion along those lines, it will have uh, more than done its job, even if nobody else buys a copy. So with that, I will say um, thank you and over to you.